I was born and raised in uh, Brooklyn, New York, during the Depression years. And um, I had never left Brooklyn uh, in growing up. I even went to Brooklyn College. And um, as World War II was approaching, I could see it was coming. I had two cousins who had been in the trenches in World War I, and I decided that I wanted to do part of the trenches and that type of warfare. So I enlisted in the Navy, not enlisted, but I applied to the Navy uh, for the cadet program. Uh, it was before the draft in 1940-41, uh, uh, yeah, before the 40, I guess. And they agreed to let me finish college. And uh, as soon as Pearl Harbor came, they called me in. I went to flight training in New Orleans for three months, and then over to Pensacola. I got my wings at the end of 1942, and uh, got my first assignment. Well, and you know where they sent me? Where? Floyd Bennett Field in Brooklyn, <laughs> on the <Andy> submarine <laughs> patrol. <laughs> I was so interested in exploring the uh, various services that I might apply to, uh, that I landed on naval aviation as being the cleanest and uh, uh, most attractive to me. Uh, I was concerned that uh, uh, I didn't want to go to get involved in the war and then become a casualty. I figured I'd join something where it would be all or nothing. And aviation appealed to me, and I preferred naval aviation over the Army. Yeah. So I went directly to 24 Church Street in New York and uh, put in my application. When you joined the program, did you have a feeling that you would be going to war soon? Oh, yes. Yeah, I knew it was coming. I was, Pearl Harbor was no surprise to me. What was your reaction when that happened? Where were you? I, I don't know where I was, except that... Uh, it was just a matter of routine to me. I, I, I fully expected it to happen uh, because of the uh, tension that kept building and the uh, embargoes on Japan. They, they had no alternative but to attack us. I had had appendicitis uh, attack uh, previously. And uh, just before I was due to go in the Navy, I had an appendicitis attack, and the doctor wanted to operate and would not be responsible for life if I didn't have the appendicitis uh, removed. Uh, I said, no, I'm going to the Navy next week, put some ice on it, <laughs> and which they did, and it subsided. I went down to New Orleans. I was only in New Orleans for a couple of weeks when the appendicitis popped up, and my first flight with the Navy was a yellow peril, a steerman, flying me from New Orleans to the hospital at Pensacola, where I had my appendix out. And then I came back to uh, New Orleans, rather. I came back to New Orleans, and I wanted to stay with my class. So uh, I did, despite my uh, weakened uh, condition from the operation. Wow. And then once you got in the sky, had you ever flown a plane before? Uh, no, I'd never flown a plane before. Uh, I'd never even been in an airplane. Um, and I did not know how to drive a car. I <laughs> learned to fly an airplane before I learned to drive a car. Is that right? Yeah. Was it something that came naturally to you? Yeah. I think maybe I went through flight training without a down check. And I think partially that might be because I... Uh, was handling controls for the first time. I was not an automobile driver changing over to an airplane. I was approaching the airplane fresh and uh, took to it right away. It had no problem. So then you went to Brooklyn. I went to Floyd Bender Field and I spent a year trying to get out of Brooklyn. <laughs> I kept applying to the captain for the fleet duty until they finally gave in and I was sent down to Washington and uh, I was given the opportunity to... Uh, Hang on one second, just sir, let's just take care of that first. <laughs> 
Okay. Uh, I was given the opportunity to uh, say what branch of uh, the Navy I wanted to fly with, the fighters, the bombers, or torpedo planes, and I decided on the dive bombers and um, uh, went to Wildwood and had uh, joined up with a group of uh, younger pilots who were right out of uh, operational training in Florida and had operational training in dive bombers where I was coming from Floyd Bennett Field where I was flying uh, OS2U uh, float planes and, uh, on wheels. And uh, I learned to dive bomb uh, simply by following what the other guys did. And uh, uh, most of the pilots who came from anti-submarine patrol and OS2Us got washed out pretty quickly, but I, there were two of us, Doc Orr and myself, who uh, stayed on with the squadron. And after we finished uh, training in Wildwood, we then joined up and had the group organization. Uh, the torpedo planes came down from Quonset, the fighter planes from, Wild, from Atlantic City, and the dive bombers from Wildwood. And we joined up in uh, Oceana and began training as a group. What appealed to you about the dive bombers? Why did you choose that? Um, I'm not sure now, looking back, but I, I think originally I chose uh, to become the scout bomber. And uh, I sort of had the image of uh, the old Indian scouts in the old west who used to go out and scout for the Indians before the uh, uh, main army. And I liked the idea of being a loner and being out there and being a scout. So I became a scout bomber. Well, the scout bombers were dive bombers. Hmm. So that's how I happened. I sort of fell into dive bombing uh, because I wanted to be a scout bomber. Is that something that you think, it's obviously different from regular bombing. Is it harder? Uh, state bus, uh, dive bombing is one of the least understood weapons that's ever existed. Uh, even to this day, they still so dive bombers coming in like this and dropping bombs and flying away. It wasn't like that at all. We came in two miles high and f I dove straight down. You were in the plane uh, looking down, hanging from your shoulder straps in the plane, looking at the planes ahead of you in their dive, seeing their bombs hit uh, as you concentrated on the target yourself and, uh, and pulled out. Uh, the 70 degree dive that they describe is because once you're in a vertical dive, you still have lift on the wings. So the plane goes like this at a 70 degree angle. So you do have to account for that in, uh, in your dive, that there is some lead of the target because of your, your uh, motion sideways. But as far as the attitude of the plane in the dive, it was vertical, not this like this. Not an angle. It's, yeah. a, it's an actual dive. Yeah. So um, we, we dove down uh, in, in the Battle of Midway. Uh, the, the pilots would drop at about 2,500 feet, although Dusty Kleiss says that when he hit the cargo, he took, went as low as 1,500 feet. Uh, that was because in the peacetime training, uh, they considered it a problem of being caught in the explosion of the planes ahead of them, mm -hmm. or even an explosion of your own bomb. So uh, you pulled out uh, 2,500 feet, but uh, in my time, when we were small, diving on smaller targets, which are much more harder to hit, uh, you, and you had to go lower if you're going to be accurate. So we went down as far as a thousand feet before we pulled out. Now a thousand feet, you're going at 500 feet a second. That means that the dive bomber had only two seconds before impact. The only difference between our dive bomber and the kamikaze that we pulled out that two seconds before impact, whereas the dive bomber, uh, whereas the kamikaze 
continued right on until the impact. Uh, the only difference between us and the Kamahok missile, <laughs> we were the first guided missiles, except we were guided by pilots who pulled out the last two seconds, and the Kamahok missile went straight in. So uh, uh, that's never been really shown in film. Well, yes, it was. There was a Japanese film that was a, a simulation, uh, computer graphics, uh, where the Japanese showed the vertical dive bombing of the Midway planes. The Japanese film was about the Battle of Midway and it showed the dive bombers coming in vertically. Now, could you release your bombs while you're in the dive or did you have to flatten out first? No, you, you released your bomb in the dive. The plane was equipped with a yoke and the yoke swung out. So when you hit the bomb release, the yoke swung out and the bomb dropped uh, so that it cleared the propeller. Mm -hmm. The yoke enabled the bomb to clear the propeller in the dive because uh, the bomb fell free and, and without any resistance, it fell faster than the airplane. And that meant that it would, had great impact. By the time it hit, hit the target, that bomb had a lot of impact from the dive bomber itself, and then after the plane was released the bomb, it picked up additional acceleration, and it hit with the target with tremendous impact. We took the Ticonderoga from its uh, launching through a shakedown in uh, 1944, and um, went out to Pearl Harbor, and our first combat missions were in November of 1944, just after the MacArthur landings on Leyte. So our first missions were to support uh, MacArthur and the landings at Leyte. And uh, that entailed, uh, uh, in our first missions, the uh, bombing of Manila, and the harbor of Manila, and the ships that were moored there. and. Um, uh, I received a DFC for one of those missions that was uh, on the morning, I think of November 14th, uh, 1944. Uh, when we came in from sea, we were about 100 miles off the Philippines. We flew in over the mountains of uh, eastern Philippines, which were about 14,000 feet high uh, across the uh, uh, farmlands until uh, we came to the city of Manila and the harbor beyond. And uh, I was the leader of the second section, uh, led by, four, uh, the division was led by Paul Callot. And uh, when we approached the city, the, it was overcast and it didn't look as if we'd be able to do any dive bombing. So uh, Paul took his first three planes and went off to the left and began letting down to get under the undercast so he could drop his bombs uh, from level flight rather than dive bombing. Uh, as I was above uh, watching him get down, I looked over to the west and I saw a hole in the clouds, like a donut hole. So I decided that maybe you could dive bomb through that. So I uh, pulled out and continued west over the uh, bay and this donut hole ahead of me began to fill up with anti-aircraft fire as the Japanese could hear, hear the planes coming. They were ranging in on that particular spot. Uh, we flew right over there and dove right through the donut hole straight down and down below us uh, like a bullseye was a Japanese cruiser, the Kiso. And, uh, uh, I dove on the Kiso and scored a hit reported by my gunner and the two other uh, pilots following me, we got another hit and the Kiso was left uh, burning and sinking. So uh, that was uh, uh, the mission on which I got my DFC. Uh, there were many, many missions after that. Uh, uh, one was uh, when we were due to retire to Ulithi for rest and recreation, uh, 
Uh, Halsey got word that the Japanese were reinforcing Leyte, and the, the fleet turned around and went in at high speed towards uh, uh, Leyte. Uh, we took off uh, at dawn. Uh, if actually dark when we rose up, we rendezvoused by the tail lights on the planes and, uh, and flew west over Leyte to Ormac Bay. And at Ormac Bay, we found the Japanese reinforcements, 15,000 troops and five destroyers. And uh, uh, our, not only the Ticonderoga planes, but two other carriers were there. So this massive dive bombers and torpedo planes came in and attacked that convoy and just wiped it out. Those uh, reinforcements never got ashore to uh, oppose uh, MacArthur's troops. Um, I also, uh, we also participated in the uh, invasion of Iwo Jima. I had a, at Iwo Jima, I flew over the island the day before the invasion at 200 feet looking for something to drop my bombs on. You couldn't see anything but pockmarked land. There were no signs of life at all. The controller finally told me to drop it on a, a map coordinates, a K-9. So I just unloaded everything I had on K-9. I don't know whether it hit anything or not. On the morning of the invasion, I had a movie cameraman in my back seat, and the movie cameraman uh, was filming the landings. The pictures you see of Iwo Jima and Mount Suribachi, you probably take it for my plane. And uh, we flew back and forth and watched the invasion. It looked like a piece of work because they hit the beach right on time, and it wasn't until the next day that we found out what a terrible beating the Marines had taken on that landing. And uh, we didn't cover the landings at Iwo Jima, but we raided Iwo Jima uh, before the landings. I, um, uh, when the Taikadaroga came out of the China Sea, Halsey took the China Sea in uh, to support Le uh, Mac uh, MacArthur again uh, when he was landing on Luzon the northern shores of Luzon, and um, they, um, weather in the China Sea was terrible, a low overcast. We flew in terrible weather, 400 foot ceilings and mist and rain. Uh, it was really bad. We felt lucky when we uh, uh, went out through the Straits back into the Pacific. But we were in the Pacific on January 21st, 45, when uh, having a, come from the China Sea, uh, when we were caught by the Kamikaze planes and our ship took two hits by Kamikaze. The first, uh, well, on the mission in the morning, uh, my plane had been shot up and I had no tail look when I got back to the carrier. so. They had me wait and land after everybody else had landed. So I was the last plane to land on the Ticonderoga without a tail hook. Uh, it took a barrier crash and uh, nobody was hurt. It went off well and I was congratulating myself when I got down to the ready room, just about to take off my flight suit, when the kamikaze went through the deck 20 feet from our light deck. All of us in the ready room were trapped. We went to the front door, it was smoke and flames. And we went to the rear door, the outdoor, outboard door, smoke and flames. We milled around in there in the smoke and flames. Georgie Sen sat down on uh, the ready room chair and said, well, I guess this is it. And then a voice came down on the squawk box and said, go aft on the port side. I was near the inboard exit. So I opened the door and there was smoke but no flame. I stepped out onto the thing and started walking along the galley uh, t towards the rear. And uh, in the smoke, I couldn't see anything, but I just sort of felt my way along. And then there's a point 
uh, midway going aft, uh, this galley opens up onto the, the hangar deck. You could look out. You just have your footing and a railing to hang on to as you go across. You don't, I got there and didn't know whether there was anything left of the galley. And I stopped. I could feel myself stepping forward and pitching down onto the hangar deck. Of course, there was no longer a galley there. But the group behind me kept pushing, so they pushed me out anyway. And I was forced to go ahead until I got to a fire door, uh, which I opened and uh, we got out. I went up inboard uh, to the flight deck, got in a uh, SB2C and began inhaling oxygen. Um, and uh, then I sort of blacked out. I don't know what happened, but from being up forward in the cockpit of a sudden SB2C, the next thing I remember, I was aft standing on the flight deck watching the second kamikaze come in 50 feet over the battleship Missouri through a hail of anti-aircraft fire. This guy just came right in and smashed into the uh, bridge of the uh, Ticonderoga. We lost a lot of guys. Um, we had 24 dive bomber pilots in the squadron at that time. Uh, one was killed and uh, five were seriously injured so that they couldn't fly anymore, including the captain and the exec. Both Annapolis men, by the way, which left the squadron without Annapolis leadership. And uh, it was not the same squadron after that. Uh, Ticonderoga was sent back to the U.S. to Bremerton to be repaired, and our squadron was transferred to the Hancock. Sir, let's pause. So we were aboard the Hancock when the Iwo Jima invasion occurred. Dixie Kiefer was the captain of the Ticonderoga, and he was a regular guy, um, a favorite of the pilots. But the skipper of the Hancock was uh, different, much sterner. Dixie allowed all of the pilots to have a case of liquor aboard which we could draw upon any time we wanted. Uh, no, it wasn't abused, it was uh, really good. That helped with but the nerves? The, when we got to the Hancock, the first thing the captain did was to line us up and throw all the booze overboard. <laughs> 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 it was a different ship. It was not a happy ship. Uh, we were not the same because of, in a way, uh, uh, we were kind of uh, shaken up a bit by what had happened. And uh, we had the leadership of a B-7 guy who had served on a destroyer who did not have as much flight time as most of us uh, in the squadron, but because of his time on the destroyer, he had the rank. And he took over as skipper of the squadron. And he was not a leader in the sense that the Annapolis men were. So that was a, a disappointment. That was the difference that we found aboard the Hancock uh, to answer your question. Halsey made tests of the torpedo bombers uh, before Pearl Harbor, early, uh, uh, before the Battle of Midway, rather, uh, early in uh, June of 1942. And he discovered that, uh, or he, uh, agreed that the torpedoes were useless. Uh, they had set up tests in the early uh, flights in the Gilberts and the Marshall Islands, where they had a group of Japanese merchant ships trapped in a harbor. And they sent in the torpedo planes to sink them, and they, each torpedo plane had a dive bomber as an escort uh, to track what happened. And they reported that none of the bombs sank None of the bombs hit and exploded on the ships. They ran erratically. Uh, uh, they ran deep. And some of them just hit the hull of the ships that they were targeting. And the torpedoes broke up and sank without exploding. So Halsey knew that the torpedo planes uh, were useless. And his plan for the Battle of Midway was that he would not use the torpedo planes but he would launch at the first sighting uh, 
of the Japanese. He would launch all of the dive bombers in a surprise attack and without escort by uh, the uh, torpedo planes or the uh, fighters. Uh, he eliminated the fighters because he felt that they were more valuable defending uh, our carriers against the possible Japanese attack, and they didn't have the range to be able to go with the uh, dive bombers uh, and stay with them through the attack and a search if necessary. Uh, Admiral Fletcher did not follow that plan in the Battle of Midway. Uh, he and Spruance decided to do the full uh, attempt at the uh, coordinated attack with dive bombers, torpedo planes, and fighters. But uh, actually, Halsey uh, did not have his heart in the battle after he had lost to Lexington and Coral Sea and had the Yorktown damaged. Uh, he was kind of uh, uh, on the defensive. Instead of holding the, the ambush station 200 miles north of Midway, uh, Fletcher put a little more distance between uh, the Japanese and his ships, and he flew searches which took our fleet east out of the ambush station 200 miles north of, Ed of Midway, and uh, at extreme range for our planes, so that all of the confusion that happened at the Bid Battle of Midway, like uh, uh, the Hornet group, for instance, that uh, not one of the Hornet, Hornet fighters or dive bombers uh, found the Japanese fleet. The torpedo planes did with John Walden, and he attacked, which he shouldn't have done because it was against fleet doctrine uh, to make an unsupported uh, uh, torpedo attack. And uh, all of his p torpedo planes were shot down except George Gay, uh, who wrote a book about it, uh, The Soul Survivor. The, um, the Enterprise uh, and the Hornet uh, each had traveled 240 degrees in search of the Japanese fleet. Uh, Admiral Commander Ring, who was commanding a Hornet group, reached the point where they expected to find the Japanese and they weren't there anymore. Uh, too much time had passed and the Japanese had uh, turned course and were headed uh, northeast. So uh, the Hornet missed uh, the rendezvous and the target and Ring turned left, uh, closing on Midway. And of course he missed the Japanese fleet. Uh, Wade McCluskey, who commanded the Enterprise dive bombers, uh, turned right at that time, and he found the Japanese uh, carriers, and he took his men in uh, and was able to sink the Kaga and the Akagi. Um, at the same time, uh, although they launched much later, the Yorktown planes arrived and they sank the uh, Siriu. There was only uh, 12 of them because Fletcher had held half of his dive bombers back for defensive purposes, and they had only six fighters to escort them. But that meant that we had, lost, we had destroyed three of the four Japanese carriers that morning. And uh, then in the afternoon, uh, they were able to put together a, a from the planes that had survived, uh, 24 planes to attack the Hiryu, and those 24 planes uh, from the Enterprise and the Yorktown, from the Enterprise rather, yeah, and they were Yorktown planes but they were flying from the Enterprise I guess, and they sank the uh, Hiryu despite the fact that they were intercepted by Japanese fighters at high altitude and harassed by the Jap fighters all the way down in their dives. Uh, they only lost three planes. In the morning, uh, McCluskey Group lost half of their planes. They had 33, they lost 17. But uh, 
Nobody knows how many were lost by Japanese fire and how many were simply lost because they went down at sea with a, uh, for lack of fuel. A, um, when, you make a a dive, I, when you make a dive bombing run, do you drop everything in, in one run or do you circle back around? No, no we dropped everything in, in one run. On an occasion like that, like that they, that's what they would do. Okay. Uh, there were circumstances later on, there was a minor, where you're doing Japanese airfields where we sometimes made uh, two separate attacks. The, um, in 1986, I guess this is what I should tell, uh, we, in 1989, we had a reunion of our squadron in Chicago, and I began to wonder in talking to the group why there was never a book written about the dive bombers. Not, there was never a book, there was never a film, there was never a TV documentary. All of the films that we had shot in combat just simply disappeared, they never surfaced. Uh, the TV programs on the uh, TV channels uh, covered every weapon since the dawn of time, the Greeks, the Romans, the Egyptians, uh, the English bowmen, uh, and then the, all the armaments in, in World War I, the, the tanks, uh, the, the fighter planes, uh, and then in, in World War II, the uh, strategic bombing. Uh, there were plenty of films about uh, World War II, but never one devoted to the dive bombers. I began to wonder why. And I began researching about the Midway, which I have done for the past 27 years. And each time I did, I peeled away more and more evidence that the Navy had suppressed the true story of the Battle of Midway and that they are still doing it. The worst was in 19, the mid-50s, 1955, when you had Crusade in the Pacific and Victory at Sea. Those two major documentaries told about the Battle of Midway, and they showed all four of the Japanese carriers being sunk by torpedoes. That was not true. And they must have known that that was not true. Now that continued on until Walter Lord's book came out about 1967, and he interviewed 400 veterans of the Battle of Midway, and he pieced together uh, a better story of what really happened. Um, but there was no uh, help to him from uh, the National Archives. Uh, I was never able to get anything out of the National Archives or the Naval History or Heritage Command. I got, I felt that I was being stonewalled for many, many years, particularly in 2014 when I spent seven months trying to get some copies of letters written by Admiral King Nimitz and Fletcher just before Pearl Harbor, uh, just before the Battle of Midway. So. It continues on to this day. I still feel that there's an awful lot about the Battle of Midway that remains to be told. Now, whether it's going to be told by a re-examination of the events, of things that really happened, or whether papers are going to turn up, memoirs of people who had participated in the battle, or whether a new generation comes along and they open up completely the archives so that the true story of what actually happened can be divulged. To this day, nobody has said who actually authorized the Battle of Midway. We had no torpedoes. Our fleet had been in the South Pacific for six months in, in war conditions. They had gone through the Battle of the Coral Sea. They were war weary in uh, May of 1942.
And Admiral Nimitz was given three weeks to pull together that fleet from the South Pacific and the Coral Sea, war weary, without torpedoes. They all needed replenishment. The air groups needed replacement pilots and planes for those that had been lost. And in three weeks, he was able to send that fleet to sea again to face a completely undefeated and powerful German, uh, Japanese fleet. Were we risking our carriers for the two little sand spits in the middle of the ocean? We gave up Guam, we gave up Wake Island without a fight. We, we, I'm sure that Nimitz and Spruance uh, would be willing to give up those sand spits in the middle of the ocean rather than risk their three carriers. But at that time, the Japanese were so powerful and they had accomplished so much in uh, moving southward from uh, Japan uh, to, into uh, the South Pacific and the Indian Oceans that Churchill was in trouble. There was a danger of having the, the British fleet was driven out of the Indian Ocean uh, in uh, April of 19. Uh, 42 by the Japanese, and they had an opportunity to blockade the in Indian Ocean. Uh, and Churchill was, he called it after the war, the most desperate hours of the war when they faced defeat. The war was in balance. Victory was in balance at that time. And all we had in the way of an offensive weapon was the dive bombers in the air and the Marines on the ground. Churchill appealed to Roosevelt for help. And I believe that one of the things that Roosevelt did to help Great Britain was the, uh, to risk our three carriers. If we had lost those three carriers, we would have been in uh, terrible shape because the US would have been forced back to the West Coast and uh, we wouldn't have effective torpedoes until September 1943, and we would have the new Essex-class carriers coming, uh, being launched, and we would again become a factor. Before that time, however, the Japanese could have turned on their traditional enemy, the Russians, and between the Germans and the Japanese, they could have defeated the uh, British at uh, El Alamein and the Russians at Stalingrad, and uh, the war could have gone completely against the British, particularly, so they would have had to sue for peace before the year and a half could go out that we could be of help to them. Right. So the consequences of Midway uh, go much, much the deeper than the just the momentum. The, the, the consequences of Midway were not just in the Pacific. They affected the outcome of the war in North Africa, in, uh, uh, in Russia, in China through the Burma Road. Lend Lease would have been cut off. Lend Lease that was supporting the British at Suez, mm -hmm. uh, supporting the Russians at Stalingrad, supporting the Chinese through the Burma Road. That all would have been cut out. And the Germans and the Japanese would have had a year and a half when they would have been free to attack the Russians. The German, the Japanese could take their Manchurian troops uh, and, and turn them loose to create a second uh, front on the Russians. Uh, no wonder Churchill called it the most desperate moment of the war. Sir. Uh, there's so much of it that uh, hasn't really been told yet that uh, I urge uh, future historians to, for one thing, read my blogs where I outline a lot of the, what I'm saying here. I have uh, 10 blogs up and running all about the Battle of Midway. I am on, on YouTube. Uh, I have a book. Uh, the uh, YouTube has a very good uh, layout of the whole thing. Uh, it's a, a speech that I made at the Taylor Convention.
in Reno in 2011. Uh, but you've got to be interested in the Battle of Midway to look at something <laughs> like that uh, because it runs for 43 minutes. And uh, that's a long time.